Continuing on with Ephesians today, a lot of great truths for people who were not a God's people, but are now God's people, and that God is going to make sure He is the one who receives the glory, and we obey. So, let's pray for His help. Father, your work uh, for your glory is what brings us joy. But Lord, we also have questions about what it, how it impacts us and what does it mean for us and all the implications. Um, we pray that we would continue to grow in our knowledge, grow in our love, and grow in its outworking as we love others. In Jesus' name, amen. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Paul is encouraging people who were, as he says here, far off from God and bringing them near by the blood of Christ. That Jesus has taken away the ordinances that were expressed by the law. Uh, we still have the moral law in place, but Jesus fulfilled the ordinances uh, which is, you know, some people say, well, how come we don't follow this law or that law? But God removed that wall of hostility. There was a wall that would separate where Jews could go and, and Gentiles couldn't. Uh, and that wall has been torn down, just like the veil was ripped open. And now it's a new creation that's being made, a household of God that he's making, no longer out of stones, but spiritual stones. Well, where do you get spiritual stones? Well, the same way that you get regular stones. God has to create them for you. 
And so God is creating a dwelling place, a tabernacle for the Spirit. And he dwells in individuals, making them new. And then you build them together to make a church, which is the bride of Christ, which we're going to see later in Ephesians is a reference to help us understand what marriage is supposed to look like in the uh, in this world we live in. Uh, the Gentiles were com- called uncircumcised because they weren't circumcised. Uh, thankfully, now we have baptism uh, instead because men and women can both be baptized. But in the same way as we saw before, baptism doesn't save you. Circumcision doesn't save Jews. It was the faith that was generated in uh, Abra- in Abraham that then God said, now signify that with everybody else through circumcision. And that faith is key because that's what is built on this premise as well of building a new temple and a new people uh, is that it's by faith you've been, uh, it's through faith that you've been saved. And all of this by the grace of God. He emphasizes twice, this is grace that saved you. Not yourself. You, you don't save yourself. It's not a transaction where it was like, if you just say this and do this, you can be saved. Now, not a lot of churches that I know of are doing altar calls as they were in the past. Uh, but we know that it does ha- need to be preached. The gospel needs to be preached. People need to uh, receive what uh, is brought to them. And we know that There's something that happens supernaturally because of the Word of God, you know, and, you know, are there, where there was no hope in the past before, right? Uh, And there's, there's no hope for people who don't repent. Uh, I do see that there's people who uh, have dreams in other cultures that point them to say, go talk to this person, similar to Cornelius, Uh, but they still need to hear the the gospel preached and the word is what changes people's hearts not an argument we don't change people's minds god changes people's hearts because it's by grace and the big challenge that a lot of people have is does god give us the faith and it says here that directly that it's this is a gift this this grace and faith is is a gift it's it's together some people argue that it's the faith is a gift uh, but everybody understands at least that it's the, the grace and the faith. All of that is a gift um, because I think grace is by itself a gift of, of God. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, we learn that God is rich in mercy because people are dead in their trespasses. We have nowhere, no reason to boast, to say what's wrong with people. I just said that uh, on the last on Ephesians 1. We are going to be praising God forever. And this, what he's done in the past and is doing now and will be fulfilled in the future, we're participating in that. And that's sanctification. That because God is rich in mercy, that is why we do good works. God prepared beforehand the things for you to do through faith and uh, not do good works in order to be saved. A lot of times we hear that and go, okay, right, but I got to do good works, right? No, no, no. God changes you. And it, you don't, you've heard the line, you don't get a new religion, you get a relationship. And if you're not in a relationship with God, where you're praying, reading the word, spending time with God's people, being sanctified, wrestling with sin, if you're not doing that, you should question what you really believe. If it's just going to church, hanging out, uh, trying to be nice. That's not Christianity. There's a lot of people that act that way, go to church, do things. This is about love for God, that worship for God in your heart, like for real, like genuinely praying to God, genuinely thanking God, genuinely wrestling with God, uh, Yeah, that's that's the Christian life. The world is you just do what you feel. The passions of the flesh, it's just pragmatic. Whatever's best, whatever you really want to do. 
uh, whatever your mind thinks of. It's just up to you. That's called a child of wrath, not a child of God. And we're not going to earn our salvation, but our works, our good works, our efforts, our repentance, they're going to show that we were saved outside without our works. Remember, we're saved by faith, by grace through faith. We will be judged by our works. And if we're arguing that we should do what our flesh says, arguing what our body wants it to do, whatever I think is right, maybe even what this world thinks, those aren't, those aren't behaviors of a Christian. And so, what do we learn about God? He wants you to be real. He wants you to repent. He wants you to experience His love for real. And that it's, that's where joy is. Not just using His ideas and His people to get what you want. And it's a great challenge. It's humbling. And uh, I battle it every day. But I hope that you would trust in this God being rich in mercy, that it's merciful what he's doing, what's merciful what he did, and it will be merciful what he does for a lifetime when he allows us to worship with him.